Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanja. Now, this week we're focusing on competition policy, in particular on the African continent, and how this is aiding or perhaps even taking away from Africa's investment case. We have an unparalleled opportunity where we're sitting down with the heads of various African competition commissions to really get a good understanding of how competition policy has contributed to economic development and investment in their particular markets. Now, for you at home, if you want to be a part of these conversations, you can certainly do that. All you need to do is drop us a tweet. That's by following us at CNBC Africa or following me at The Real Nozi. Of course, the hashtag for the show is Invest Africa. So as we start our show, let's get into a conversation with the Competition and Consumer Protection Commissioner, Commissioner for Zambia, and that's Mr. Shulufia Sampia, giving us a sense of how competition uh, policy is playing out in the Zambian market. Thank you uh, for making the time Thank to you. join us, Shulufia. Uh, let me just maybe start off with your understanding of how competition policy influences the investment case for a particular market. Well, competition uh, policy, and, <clears throat> and, and of course within that is the competition law which we enforce, uh, basically breaks down the barriers. Mm. So if you, we, we at Zambia, we're in a um, command economy, and uh, now we are in a, a market economy, and basically what happens is that a uh, competition law is there just to break down the barriers to allow um, investors to, to, to come into, into, into Zambia. So these, these barriers are, are married, mm. they're quite, quite a number and can be caused as a result of um, uh, companies that are incumbent, mm -hmm. pro previously maybe had been government owned and now they are private owned and um, they are entrenched mm -hmm. within a particular market. Mm -hmm. And our role is to ensure that the barriers that are there uh, are, are removed mm -hmm. that would allow other investors to come into a particular market and invest. And perhaps uh, you could share with us, Shulufia, a case that comes to mind where uh, it had to be the intervention of competition policy to allow that a particular investment opportunity to, to take place and to develop within your market? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of the telecommunications industry, for example. The, um, what had happened was that the incumbent, which is Zambia Telecommunications Corporation, uh, which is also a government-owned in the um, uh, firm, uh, had the international gateway, uh, so which means that the other investors that came in, like Airtel and MTN, uh, could not um, actually, you know, use the international gateway unless they use the incumbent. And uh, with our intervention, now what you have is that the, the the other companies as well have their own international gateways. Mm. And as a result, you, you, what you see is uh, a, a reduction in the prices of international calls. And then, of course, there's the investment that has come into this particular uh, uh, sector mm. uh, where we are now experiencing the, the 4G network now. And, and this is because of the, that intervention. Mm. I do not think if um, that had been allowed to stay, mm we would have uh, had that inv investment. And of course, it must have been the consumers that were ultimately benefiting, especially with the reduction of prices. What is the approach uh, that this particular commission takes when it comes to the protection of consumer rights in the Zambian market? Well, uh, the Zambian law uh, has two, two aspects, mm. both the consumer protection aspect and the competition aspect. But the ultimate goal, whether you take the objective of the consumer aspect or the objective of the com uh, competition side, is to enhance consumer welfare. So um, uh, w whatever we do, whether we are enforcing competition regulations or we are enforcing the consumer protection aspects, mm. uh, the ultimate uh, beneficiary is the consumer. Mm. So definitely, yes, with that intervention in the telecommunications sector, uh, definitely the, the consumers did benefit with uh, lower rates. and. Mm now innovative uh, uh, uh 
innovative uh, uh development exactly <laughs> so i i want to come back to the, the the fundamentals around the zambian economy i mean for many investors watching this show they know zambia for its copper deposits but we do know that there has been considerable effort to uh, diversify that particular economy would you say that competition com uh, policy is ahead or maybe lagging behind some of the economic diversification initiatives that the government is pushing no definitely not i in in fact, I think an investor would want rather go into a market which has a, a thriving competition policy or a competition law. Um, yes, there are quite a number of sectors where you would want to come in. And what we are doing is breaking down the barriers mm. that would stop uh, investors from, from investing in Zambia. And that is what we are doing. So we are creating an uh, enabling environment. Mm. Uh, for, for investors to come in. So we have areas like in the energy sector, I mean, energy is literally affecting the whole of Southern Africa. Mm. Uh, there are opportunities there. In the agricultural sector, um, the government right now has uh, opened up uh, almost, I think, a million hectares of land, mm. which is um, inviting people to come in and invest. So all these things are as a result of us trying to break down the barriers mm that would uh, essentially prevent uh, investors from investing in Zambia. So there we have it. We've heard that a competition policy, one of the key reasons it does exist is to ensure that we're able to break down the barriers that it would inhibit free competition, in particular in a market economy. And looking at Zambia as a case study, telecommunications has been one of the key sectors where we've seen competition policy really making a difference in the investment landscape. We're going to turn our focus now to Tanzania and hear what this case study of this particular market tells us around their competition policy. I'm now joined by the Director General of the Fair Competition Commission, Mr. Frederick Ringel from Tanzania. Frederick, again, thank you for your time. We heard uh, from Shalufia that uh, you know, competition policy is very important for breaking down barriers that allow competitive behavior. What happens when corporates don't play ball? What is your approach and your philosophy around how do you punish corporates so that they get back within the rules of the game? We uh, have a law which has offenses. Mm -hmm. And once they, uh, they, 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 um, they break the law, there is uh, a provision which says that the commission can charge them. Mm -hmm. And once they're charged, they have to pay a fine mm -hmm. between ranging between 10 to 5 percent of their turnover for that year. Of Is that the same across all sectors, that the range of uh, between 5 to 10 percent? Uh, is that the same across all sectors? Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, across all sectors. And uh, once you've offended the law, what, what has been the response to that? Because I'll give you the South African example where, yeah. where, for example, in the construction sector, there's been a lot of public outcry about how fines have been levied, right. uh, saying that these penalties are too soft yes. and they're not going to deter future anti-competitive behavior. What has been the reception of your 5 to 10% limit in your market? Actually, uh, usually there's a settlement. Mm. Usually when the, when the companies realize that they have uh, uh, offended the law, they usually settle. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they settle, we cannot go beyond five mm -hmm. when it's settlement. But if you, if you take 10% of a turnover, yeah. it's really high. That's a really high. So uh, that, does, that does, to a certain extent, make a dent in, in, on the bottom line. That's true. That's true. It, it really is not as a small. It's really high. Maybe also help us, Frederick, understand which sectors are more prone to collusive behavior. Um, is there a trend that we can pick up, even if it's not specific to the Tanzanian market, but across the African continent, say these are the sectors that are perhaps most active and most prone to anti-competitive behavior? Yes, especially in consumer goods. Mm. Things like cement, electrical products, those are very prone. Things that move, fast move. Mm -hmm. Those are very prone to, um, to cartels. Uh, but uh, we are seeing more and more even in the, in the agricultural sector. Mm. What, what drives cartels? What is it that, uh, is it just about a, cha a, a, a chasing of prices and to make premium margins on yes, the products? Or are the, there anything, is there anything else? Usually it's first of all to ensure that others don't come to compete. Yeah. S that they, if others don't come in, we can have premium mm -hmm. profits. And not only have proven for profits, but be able to control the market. Mm. They, they control the economy. 
that's the main incentive. And so consumer moving goods in the main, and you've mentioned agriculture almost as an emerging space where anti-competitive behavior is coming through. Give us a sense of what's happening in, in the agricultural space that's breeding anti-competitive behavior. Okay, for example, you look at uh, things like tobacco. Mm. They control the, the, the uh, fertilizers, that you make a huge profit from fertilizers. They control the, the harvesting and the selling and buying of tobacco. They control the value chain. And, and that's exactly my point to say that if one player is in control of the value chain, then you probably have mm. uh, the, the, a higher probability that there might be anti-competitive behavior. Correct. So how do, you, how do you remedy that? Do you then disconnect the value chain mm. or, or do you just make sure that there, there, there are legal parameters within which to play? Okay, the law says we need to investigate. Yeah. We study the sector, we investigate. Once we find that there are people who are, have cartelized, that's an offense. Mm -hmm. And we then we, we punish. However, sometimes we, we, have, we have a lenient policy. And somebody can say, oh, I don't want to take advantage here. I don't want to be fined. So they come forward mm. and they tell us, oh, um, we've been doing this. And uh, once they reveal to us that they've been doing that, we, we forgive the, 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 the transgression. The correct. For that person only, mm -hmm. the others face the full penalty of the law. Mm. And now, you've also raised a very important point, and that is about making sure that entry barriers into the market remain high so that new entrants do not uh, come in. How has this impacted on how markets are structured in Africa? Right. Um, pr previously, most of the markets were controlled by transnational corporations. They have local entities that make sure that they have the, the fact. They may, m market entry may be, may be, may be um, caused by just high capital costs. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that, that we, cannot, we cannot force that opening of that market because it's a capital intensive market. Mm. But where, where the predatory pricing, for example, when somebody comes in, they lower the prices beyo below production costs so that the guy doesn't move in. Those are issues that competition enters. Mm. Uh, see, they also, for example, do, you, know, uh, do, you know, control information. And people don't know exactly how the pricing is done, or who, what, the, what are the inputs, mm. what do they? So they, they sort of, you know, meet in the in secret. Mm. It's, it's almost criminal. Yes. And they now say, okay, we have the market. They can say, oh, we parcel out. You don't come into Zambia, and we don't come into Tanzania. So they parcel out the market between themselves, and they make premium profits. Their main aim is profits, mm. huge pr profits. Now Africa. Our aim in Africa is to, you know, to remove p people from poverty. And some of this money would have been used to bring up people's uh, you know, lives. Mm. So, we, these, so we, as Sampa said, we are there, there to make sure that we make sure that the um, uh, poverty is actually addressed. Mm. And one way is to break these cartels and make sure that prices come down mm. and consumers benefit. Frederick, thank you so much for your time. That's Frederick Ringo. He's the um, Director General at the Fair Competition Commission in Tanzania. And a very salient point being made here that cartels impede poverty reduction and poverty alleviation efforts on the African continent and I'm quite certain elsewhere in the world. And this is why competition policy is so important. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we're going to be speaking from a rep with a representative rather from Comesa and really beginning to understand how competition policy at a regional level begins to play itself out. Let's see you in two minutes. Welcome back to Invest Africa. If you've just joined us, we are looking at competition policy on the African continent and really beginning to understand how it is shaping the investment landscape into the various markets. We turn our focus now to the Comesa Competition Commission, where we speak to the director and CEO, Mr. Georgia Lipimile. Thank you for making the time to join us. Uh, really insightful conversations in the first half of the show, but let's maybe get a regional understanding. How does competition policy work in a regional setting? Well, the Comesa Competition Commission is created under the Comesa Treaty itself. Why was it created? 
Its main focus is to ease the cost of doing business in the common market. Mm -hmm. It looks at all the processes, the procedures of trying to notify agreements mm -hmm. so that we mop out at competitive practices in the market. Mm. So what it does as the Commercial Competition Commission, first we have got to understand that this is the first of its kind in Africa which is operational. Mm -hmm. Although the other regional agreements like ECOWAS, ESC, yes. and uh, they have got provision to create uh, regional competition authorities, they haven't been able to, but Comesa mm. is the first one which has the managed to create the regional competition so, authority. So if we take a look at this pioneering initiative uh, in Comesa, what would you describe as having been one of the toughest challenges uh, that, uh, that the commission has had to take on to ensure that it, it, it eases the cost of doing business in the region? Actually, we should give credit to the member states. Mm. How does it ease the cost of doing business? Previously, say if you have got to affect a major in the commercial region, mm. you are required to visit every national competition authority, each member states, and get approval. But now with the commercial regional competition authority, you don't need to get approval from each member state. Mm -hmm. It is just one application to the commercial competition commission, which gives you a multiple approval, which covers all the member states. Mm. And, and what would you say has been uh, the biggest success variable? Because one would assume that if you're working with multiple states, you're possibly looking at a variety of competition policies that at times might not even speak to each other. How did you overcome that and what would you say has been the biggest success of the Commission? Actually, the biggest success goes to the investor himself mm. in that now is able to get the approval in record time. Secondly, the cost, instead of paying notification fee to each member state, now it pays just one notification fee. Mm. And it lessens the cost by 63%, according to our calculations. Mm. And then, instead of getting translation, say, if you have to uh, make an application to Egypt, you have to make an application to Comoros, to Burundi, it means that these multiple applications have got to be in official languages in French, English, Arabic. But now it's just one application to the Commercial Competition Commission and we are able to liaise with the, our member states. Mm. So the red tape seems to be cut down substa completely. substantially. Completely. Now, given the fact that this is the first of its kind in Africa, if we were to look at potentially replicating this commission within other regional economic communities, what would you extrapolate and say that these are the key lessons and insights that should be considered uh, if another commission of this nature is set up in, an, in, in a different part of the continent? Yes, the first thing is that uh, the other economic blocks, they will have somebody to look at, Comesa, mm. to see where we succeeded, what problems we faced, and where we are now. Because ourselves, we've got nobody to look at apart from the mm. European yes. Union. Secondly, member states of these other African blocks, economic blocks, They've got to be that willingness, the political will, mm. uh, to make it happen. Mm. It's one thing creating a regional organization, yeah. but it is the other thing to listen to it and give it the leeway to enforce the law or to enforce the treaty. And this is what Commerce has done, that the states have willingly allowed themselves to give up matters of competition and police, mm. which affect Mm. two or more member states to Comesa. Mm. While those which affect individual countries, which don't have the cross-border effect, yes. they still remain with the national competition authorities. And that's uh, George Lipimile. He is uh, the director and chief executive of the Comesa uh, Competition Commission. And of course, sharing some very important insights around how do you bring down the cost of business. And one of the ways you do that is that within the regional context, you begin to build 
bring down the red tape that hinders uh, the cost of business and the movement of people and goods. And we're certainly seeing uh, Comesa pioneering with that on the continent. Now, before we wrap up on the show, we will be bringing you yet another conversation and this conversation here in South Africa. I'm joined now by Tamara Dini. She's a partner at Bowman Gilfin Africa Group, and she joins us now for a perspective from South Africa. We know that South African business has been quite adventurous in terms of penetrating other markets on the African continent. Are they playing within the rules? Let's find out from Tamara. Tamara, thank you for making the time uh, to join us. Uh, just to pick up on that question, where we've seen our South African businesses really tapping into uh, other African markets, would you say that we're also leading in terms of competition policy? Um, certainly South Africa as a competition regulatory system yeah. has been very much a leader um, on the continent, although its competition law only came into effect in 1999, but a lot has happened. We've learned a lot of lessons since then and the practice um, has evolved quite mm -hmm. a lot. Um, the Competition Commission has also had a huge amount of successes in cartel busting and it's made a huge impact, um, which is often picked up yeah. on the press. And yes, a lot of other regulators on the continent are now really coming to the fore. They're very active, not only in relation to merger control, mm. but also in respect of prohibited practices. Mm -hmm. So it's become really important for all businesses operating in Africa to pay attention closely to what the regulators there are doing mm -hmm. and to um, the requirements of the of the legal systems there. Tomorrow it certainly sounds like the competition uh, landscape and competition policy in South Africa is getting visibility, but how do we increase effectiveness? What would you say needs to be done to ensure that the, the, the commission has more teeth and has greater enforcement power? There, well, there are a couple of things. The, the most powerful enforcement tool of the Commission has been its corporate leniency policy. And so that means that um, firms come forward and whistleblow, they bring forward their own contraventions in exchange for immunity. And that's recognized as the most effective way. It's been hugely effective in South Africa and will probably become enormously effective in other African jurisdictions in, in that context. Um, importantly for our authority is there's a great need as with any regulator, to have well-qualified staff, um, good leadership, continuity, um, as opposed to high mm. staff turnover. And there's a whole lot that goes with ensuring that a competition regulator is constantly mm. up to speed and has the resources to investigate what can be very complex cases. Mm. We, we've recently seen with MTN in Nigeria a spillover of politics into the regulatory space. I, is this an inherent danger that is always facing the competition space? Because when, when, when a certain player says we're escalating this to the president, it seems that it's not a regulatory issue so much, more of a diplomatic and a political uh, issue at that point. Right. That, I mean, there's a there's a serious concern about independence on the part of mm. a competition regulator and that also flows into how foreign investors perceive the country so um, South Africa has managed to have a very independent competition um, commission and competition tribunal which has been part of its success mm. um, in other jurisdictions I think it's also recognized that that this independence has been important and um, steps must be taken mm. to ensure that that, um, that transparency and independence on the part of the regulator is maintained. That's a really interesting insight because we also know that uh, state-owned enterprises are also other players in the market. What have been the major trends around how competition policy has engaged with you know, st state-owned entities that are also looking for business as do normal corporates in the same space? Um, State-owned enterprises are subject to exactly the same mm. rules under the Competition Act as any other entity. Um, and just going back to your point about the independence of the authority, certainly the first um, enterprise in South Africa to be hit with a big penalty was South African Airways. Um, so, you know, they, they are really subject to the same mm. requirements. Um, and as with all players, they've had to bring themselves up to speed mm -hmm. with the, the culture of competition law. Mm -hmm. And it's still relatively new here, but I think by now business is 
quite au fait with what they need to do. Tamara, thank you so much for your time. That's Tamara Dini, she's a partner at Bowman Gilfin um, Africa Group and certainly hammering home some very important points around ensuring that the regulatory environment exudes certainty and consistency for investors wanting to plow their dollars into that particular market. We have unfortunately come to the end of the show, so thank you so much for making the time to join us at home. Remember that if you want to make suggestions on which sectors or investment opportunities you'd like us to talk about here on Invest Africa. All you need to do is just drop me a tweet following me at CNBC Africa or at The Real Nosy and of course use the hashtag Invest Africa. Until next time, from myself and the Invest Africa team, it's goodbye.